Welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Lauren Manier and I am a senior program associate with the Inclusive STEM Ecosystems for Equity and Diversity or ICEED program at the American Association for the Advancement of Science. And I work on our AAAS IUS initiative, which is hosting today's workshop. Um, our workshop today is titled STEM Learning Through Community Engagement. And we are excited to hear from our presenters today, Dr. Matthew Wolfram, Dr. Morwell Gasela, and Dr. Sonia Remington Doucette. Before we get started with the presentations, um, I have a few housekeeping notes. This presentation is being recorded. The recording will be made available in the coming days on our website, and it will be emailed to you as well. You can view and download the slides um, as well as a few handouts for today's workshop on our website. Um, please note that we will transition into discussion breakout rooms following the three presentations. These breakout rooms will allow for deeper engagement and they will not be recorded. Additionally, we have closed captioning for this workshop. If you want to download and view the full transcript, you can click the CC button at the bottom of your screen. So before turning it over to our presenters, I wanted to provide a little background about AAAS and our IUS initiative. The American Association for the Advancement of Science was founded in 1848 and is an international nonprofit organization dedicated to advancing science, engineering, and innovation to benefit all people with the specific goals of strengthening and diversifying the science and technology workforce and fostering education in science and technology for everyone. With more than 120,000 individual members in more than 91 countries, AAAS is the world's largest multidisciplinary science society and a leading publisher of cutting edge research through the science family of journals. Uh, more information is available at AAAS.org. For those of you who are new to the AAAS IUS initiative, the initiative seeks to support faculty, students, and the greater undergraduate STEM education community by disseminating research and knowledge about STEM teaching, learning, equity, and institutional transformation. We invite you to learn more about the AAAS IUS initiative on our website, and we hope that you'll join our community as future contributors. You can also follow us on Twitter at IUS Program and LinkedIn to stay up to date on our latest events, blogs, or to share what you've learned at today's workshop. Um, so without further ado, I'd like to turn it over to our first presenter today, um, Dr. Matthew Wolfgram, who is an associate researcher at the Center for Research on College Workforce Transitions at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. So Matt, over to you. Well, uh, uh, great to have this opportunity uh, to meet and interact with you around this uh, important topic. Um, uh, today, I'm going to talk about uh, STEM learning through student-engaged participatory action research. Um, uh, so, uh, I'm a you know I, I do I guess more traditional mixed methods and qualitative research at uh, the Center for Research on College Workforce Transitions, uh, but with a colleague of mine, uh, she and I. Um, Tries to develop a, a sort of newer, a new line of research to um, to engage students, particularly students of color, in a high level of uh, of research leadership and engagement, um, and um, uh, to do work that you know to have to mentor them to do work that is sort of important to them. And I wanted to so this is a we can call this for the time being participatory action research. It's also called community based participatory action research, um, and. Uh, um, so, what we uh, um, so th so that that's the line of you know research that I'm sort of I want to say is a way that we can engage students, particularly students of color, um, in uh, STEM STEM research, STEM practices, and advocacy for their own education. Um, and so, um, uh, what I you know so I'm partnering with a, a group of you know, I'm going to talk about some research that we uh, I have several projects that uh, par par research groups. One of them was, is with, with a group of Hmong American uh, college students at the University of Wisconsin Madison. So that group is called the Hmong American Studies Committee. Um, I'm at CCWT, and then my colleague Bailey Smolarik and I have a like a training institute that we're developing. I can talk about that 
also uh, in the end, uh, where we can provide training on this form of action research. Um, so, advance, okay. So how can we support student learning through community engagement? That's the big question today. Uh, and so what I wanna talk about is what is student engaged participatory action research? I'm going to give an example uh, of a project, uh, sort of, you know, my most mature um, and most, I guess it's been going for three years, my most advanced action research group. Um, and uh, that's the group of the Hmong Americans. It's called Our Hmong American College Pantau, and I'll talk about that title in a minute. Um, so, and then I'm gonna talk about um, sort of learning outcomes of this form of student engagement um, and institutional and community outcomes or impacts. Um, and then just kind of the issues around uh, doing this as a form of STEM engagement. And then um, I'll put my questions for everyone um, that we'll address in the discussion. So um, what I wanna do, so you might be thinking like, okay, um, student research, that's something I've heard of or I've done a lot of, you know, either way. Uh, I engage my students and my undergraduates as much as possible in my STEM research. and uh, it's really effective. Uh, well, um, one thing that we've heard from students and, and, and one of the ways I wanna contrast this is uh, par with traditional undergraduate research is you know, just the, the hierarchical nature of undergraduate research. So you know, in undergraduate research, there's a pr principal investigator who is on the IRB and who has the research grant and who is lead author on all the papers and uh, basically, gives the undergraduates mentorship and also direction and supervision about the work that they should be doing. Um, PAR is community-based. So the, the questions, the research questions and the goals of the research emerge in a dialogue between the researcher and the community. In this case, the community is a community of undergraduate students, minoritized undergraduate students. Um, so, so rather than the model of like a a PI and, and then work, work you know, under, uh, novice researchers, it's more a mentorship mentee relationship. Um, and so in PAR, we try to, you know, as best we can, it's not unproblematic, there's challenges to it, but we try to share and distribute power on the research group. Uh, you know, technically I am the PI, I do get the grants, I am on the IRB, but uh, on a daily basis, I try to, um, to center my power to, you know, to rather be a mentor than a, you know, uh, than the director of the project and, and let the students take the lead. Um, so the, the thing about the thing about PAR projects is that the students engage in every aspect of the research project. So think about, you know, the designing of preliminary research questions. Uh, the, um, the, you know, of course, there's protocols that need to be developed. There's uh, um, um, protocols and a recruitment strategy that needs to be identified. And, and then, you know, so the, you know, everything about the planning, the actual data collection itself, uh, and then the, the analysis, and then the dissemination. So all of our, all of our papers are co-authored and, you know, we try and develop um, equitable authorship guidelines on, on our team. Um, and then, you know, the last thing is because this is action research, the primary goal is to impact change, um, and uh, it, particularly it's institutional change. So I think you know, for, for us in our discussion, we could say like increased you know uh, uh, quality learning environments and uh, and outcomes for uh, students of color in STEM programs, and you know access better access to STEM professions and careers. Uh, that could be a general outcome that we would like to affect through an action research agenda. So here's my team. This is our. This is the current year of our team, um, the Puntal research, research team, and uh, you know you can see me in the back and my colleague Bailey, and then the rest are are Hmong American college students, uh, and uh, this is the third year uh, uh, that we've been going, and each year we get a number of students stay on, and then a number of new students join, um, and all the students they're all, they're they're members of our research team, but they're also members of a student organization that they themselves have formed. Uh, and the goal of that student organization is to advocate for uh, Hmong studies, you know, which is a form of ethnic studies on campus, and just the, the well-being and educational success and support of Hmong students at a PWI, which is UW-Madison. 
So I talked about how like the students engage in sort of all aspects of the project. This, this even, even the term itself, the, the, the name of the, the title of the research team and the title of the, uh, of the research project, which uses the, the Hmong phrase, uh, pan tao, which is a story cloth or flower cloth. Um, this is like a, uh, um, a beautiful, there's an example, they're beautiful tapestries that, uh, um, um, this is a tradition that started in Southeast Asia, but it, it changed pretty dramatically. And it, when uh, when uh, Hmong were resettled into the United States. And now these story cloths tell the story of displacement in, during the war and uh, ref being resettled into camps in Thailand and then being resettled into America. They kind of tell that story. Um, and uh, so they're very beautiful. And the students want to take this as a metaphor for their research on their own college experience. So the, 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 the project is called Our Hmong American College Pantau. Um, and so it's a very sort of non-traditional um, name for a social science research project. Uh, I've never come up with a name like, never would have come up with a name like this for myself. Um, also, you know, you can see at the bottom that the students themselves develop the research questions. The second one we developed more recently and it relates because STEM and struggles that Hmong students had with STEM courses at UW-Madison has become a concern. We've reoriented from a more general RQ to a more STEM specific RQ. And that's what our, most of our work is on now, um, you know, removing obstacles for Hmong students to uh, STEM degrees and careers. Uh, even the term, even the way that the word Hmong is spelled, if you know how to spell the, the word Hmong in English, that's not how they spell the H-M-O-O-B is not how they, they even the how to spell the name of their language and culture um, was a matter of debate that they put lots of thought into. This has actually been a bit of a problem because, you know, when we publish, some people don't recognize what we're talking about right away. So we, but it was really important to them that they sort of decolonize the representation of their community. Um, so this is, like I said, three years of research. This is for a qualitative research project. This is a massive amount of data. Uh, and it's very, uh, um, so I'm very proud of this slide, of all the work that uh, that uh, our students have put into this. So it started out with, with um, with 27 interviews. And then in year two, um, we followed up with some of those 27, but we added a substantial amount more. Uh, and uh, we've also interviewed staff. We're, we're continuing to interview staff. Now we have about 10 interviews with staff to need to update the slide. Um, and then the, um, you know, what's great about year two is we interviewed current students. We also interviewed among alumni uh, from UW and we interviewed students who either transferred from UW or stopped out of school entirely because of problems, problems in their STEM programs, problems in the, the climate on campus, problems with just racism. Um, and, um, and so that, uh, we, we also did a follow-up uh, during the COVID pandemic to sort of see how students were faring. Uh, not very well, there was a lot of anti-Asian racism at UW-Madison as elsewhere during the pandemic, especially at the beginning of the pandemic. Uh, we did participant observation and autoethnography. So autoethnography means like these are students who they're among American college students and the re research project is about that community. And so they write their own stories as a form of data as well. So that's autoethnography. So that's the example of the college Pantau. There's a couple of, you know, I, I've done a project with Muslim American uh, female college students on, uh, at, at a, at a uh, I guess a, a non-selective um, uh, regional comprehensive uh, university with uh, African-American college students at a PWI. Uh, um, and right now I'm starting a group with students with disabilities uh, researching on like um, the process of obtaining accom accommodations um, and uh, academic and other accommodations. Um, and so, um, so it should be AAC and you, sorry. Uh, it considers uh, undergraduate research to be a high impact practice, of course, I, I'm sure you're aware of this. Um, I, I would suggest that this kind of, this participatory action research is a kind of, you know, sort of, you know, accelerated, supersized high impact practice. It's all the benefits of undergraduate research, but it's additional levels of en student engagement, of student leadership, of um, students doing, planning, doing, conducting, analyzing, and writing social science research, uh, more professional networking, more writing and presentation skills, 
Um, and then, you know, it's research for advocacy, for their own advocacy. That's one of the reasons why the students are so motivated to do it. It's like they were doing this work before they had a mentor to help them and before I was paying them. They were doing it for free and without any help. And um, now, you know, they're now we're giving them more tools uh, and mentorship. And all of this sort of relates to this idea of uh, critical, you know, Pablo, uh, uh, Paulo Freire's concept of critical self-consciousness. So they're sort of analyzing the, 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 themselves and their own experiences in writing and analyzing about them. Um, so uh, let's see. So um, these are some of the reports that we had. You can see there's an academic article there, uh, uh, several reports. Um, these are all, these reports are all about, and there's an op-ed in the Heckinger report. Here, the concern was, is that student, students were concerned about sort of the invisibility of the Hmong Americans on campus, and that there was sort of no attention being placed by leadership on, on their, their needs uh, um, and concerns, and, and also the sort of racism that they were experiencing. And so this was all sort of around that, and one of the main outcomes that they wanted and got was more funding and, and an actual program, not a program, it's like a certificate um, emphasis of, a, of the Asian studies major, minor um, focused specifically on critical Hmong studies, employing feminist approaches and, so, and, and decolonial approaches to Hmong uh, history and culture. Uh, another set of, these are some other, so I'm, I'm really talking not about the learning outcomes, but about the the impacts, community impacts. Um, so, you know, we've raised attention uh, on the issue of that Asian Americans are often categorized, when they're categorized as a group, Southeast, Southeast Asian experiences are sort of erased. This is sort of a problem of how data gets aggregated. Uh, and we've, so we've, we've made data available for the first time so that educators can see that the Southeast Asians are not, their experiences are, are being represented uh, improperly, basically, because um, other Asian Americans and international students are um, more affluent, often more educated, you know, have better um, uh, preparation and background and so on. Um, and then we're now we're turning our research, as I said, to the issue of STEM. So this the, the report, uh, there's a report here. Uh, we've also received funding to to work with advisors in STEM fields uh, to give them particular training on how to, on how to work with students of color, uh, because we've identified in our data a number of problem problematic advising practices um, in the STEM community, in particular um, programs that were related to limited uh, enrollment uh, colleges and programs. Um, and so that's you know now we're sort of directing in the, us and the students we're directing all our, our research and engagement towards improving. STEM learning, uh, the climate in STEM units on campus, and uh, better, more um, sort of acid-paced approaches to um, STEM advising. How much time um, do I have left? Sorry. I'll just, uh, I, I'm not sure how much time I have left, but. Um, um, About eight minutes. Eight minutes, okay, good. So I'm like right on. Because uh, I'm about ready to finish up. Thank you. Um, okay, so I, if I, the take home point, you know, I, I got to spend a little time today bragging about my group that I really love and I'm very, very proud of. Uh, but the take home, the take home point is, is that student engaged PAR um, is a highly impactful form of undergraduate research. It's, I, I believe it's, it sort of takes all the good things about undergraduate research and amplifies them considerably. Um, it's associated with high levels of STEM engagement. So this would be like social science and policy analysis and so on. Um, and learning and community impacts. Um, you know, minoritized college students are often a challenge to engage in, in, in these high impact practices and the ones related to STEM in particular. And so this is a, I, we believe this is a, a form of undergraduate research that has lots of community as well as high impact practices for students, particularly minoritized students and minoritized communities on campus and sort of in our community in general. Uh, so these are questions. Um, are there policy problems or, uh, or student communities? So think about this when we talk, or you know, if, if you happen to join my group to talk. Um, what problems on your campus uh, or student communities would you consider engaging with? Um, to start one of these action research groups? 
so uh, I talked about the Hmong American group, uh, the students with disabilities are concerned about, you know, the process of accommodations. Uh, they feel kind of marginalized by the process and overexposed. And so they're researching that. And then we're working with a group of students with disabilities. Uh, the Muslim students were exposed, were concerned about sort of um, attention and inappropriate sort of behavior, uh, uh, gazing and other things calling out that would happen on campus to hijabis, women who wear the hijab on campus. And so that we worked with the Muslim student organization for that. Um, we worked with the black uh, student union on a campus, a PWI, to talk about, to work on issues of climate. So imagine yourself in our shoes or imagine yourself, is there a problem that you think needs to be addressed or is there a student group that is working on a problem and maybe not making headway that they need and they are the ones who could use mentorship and some resources. Um, what issues, okay, so this is about an action research group. What issues might you anticipate in, in creating an action research group in a classroom or in some other kind of organizational setting? You know, a student org in your unit, for example, uh, or a, a part of a professional organization on campus. And so there's diff, um, um, there, you know, there are some challenges, but there are some opportunities for sort of putting this into these more traditional academic structures. Um, what, be, what might be characteristics of a high quality mentorship in the context of student engaged PAR study? So you, I, I'll warn you, you kind of, if you wanna take this on, you kind of need to be the kind of person who can share power with undergraduates and share decision-making. And um, there's tools that, you know, in the literature for how to do this uh, well. Uh, and for monitoring and checking power relations on research teams. Um, but I do think it takes a special kind of scholar, special kind of mentor uh, to really um, want to um, empower and mentor students to do their best work uh, and, and in, a, in an independent sort of way. And then what resources would be needed by these students? Um, so, you know, I told you I'm the PI, so I get the money and I make sure that the students get paid and their HR benefits are taken care of. Um, I, you know, have to make sure that everything is copacetic with IRB and, you know, our data is being handled properly. Um, and so there's various like resources and skills that the students, their, their time is better spent in designing, conducting research and using the data to advocate. And so as a scholar, how can I get the resources the best resources and the best mentorship to those, those activists, those student researchers. Um, so those are my um, those are my questions that I think are worth diving into, and there's probably others as well. Um, so uh, last slide just has you know that's the link for the CCWT uh, Center for Research and College Workforce Transitions. If you're interested in internships, by the way, we have a huge program of research and lots of resources related to college internships. Um, so if you want to learn more about the Pantau team, uh, that uh, this link here is available. Uh, also in the handouts, I created, uh, there's a handout with all the presentations and publications of the Pantau team. It's, a, it's an extensive, very productive team. Um, uh, there's another handout in there. Um, a scholar um, has created a nice table that contrasts PAR with um, traditional research. And I did, had a slide that did that, but there's a nice, a more in-depth table that nicely lays it out that I put in the handouts as well. And then, you know, I, I, I just, I wanna put myself out there as available to be, you know, please contact me if you have questions. Um, my colleague and I are, are developing some training opportunities for this that will be free um, and will provide resources, um, training and mentorship to the scholars who, scholars and activists and um, uh, educators who would like to start a group like this um, and make some change. Uh, so thank you, I look, I'm probably about to time, so let me stop sharing. Uh, thanks everyone for your attention. Looking forward to talking. Great, thank you so much, Matt. And thank you for posing those questions. Um, we look forward to continuing the conversation in the breakout rooms, which will happen after our next presenters. So I now want to turn it over to our next presenter, Dr. Morwell. Gasela, who is an assistant professor of physics at Xavier University of Louisiana. Uh, Morwell, over to you. So thank you very much. And thank you for the introduction, Lauren. 
Uh, once again, uh, my name is Mowal Gasela. I, I am a faculty in the physics department at uh, Xavier University of Louisiana here in New Orleans. Today, I'm going to talk to you about how some faculty from Xavier University and some teachers from Morris Jeff Community School and the, the Louisiana Department of Environmental Quality and the Institute of Earth Science Research and Education all came together in pursuit of providing quality, quality STEM education to Xavier students. So what is EcoSTEM? Environmental computing and community engagement in STEM education is a three-year project funded by the National Science Foundation through its IUS program and is directed by Xavier University of Louisiana. The main purpose of the EcoSTEM project is to expand the meaning and implementation of STEM education for Xavier students and faculty. So we believed from the very beginning that EcoSTEM needed nanny Xavier participants in order to provide community engagement opportunities for both Xavier students and Xavier faculty. And we also needed to establish a science focus from the very beginning. We needed to establish a science focus on an environmental issue that is relevant to both Xavier students and the community around, surrounding Xavier. So we chose to focus on uh, air quality monitoring. Air pollution is a very important issue. In, in, it's an important environmental issue for minority communities around Xavier. And studying particulates matter using Arduinos presents opportunity to include uh, computing and coding into the STEM programs at Xavier. And we, we also focused on monitoring PM 2.5 and PM 10, because these are the environmental protection agency air, C, C pollutants that normally determines the value of the air quality index, especially here in New Orleans during the the fall and spring months in the summer other pollutants are also become more more important mm. so 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 let me cycle back and and talk about the, what is the structure of um, the ecosystem project so there are two Xavier faculty involved in the project. I am the PI and I am in charge of the research students. And I've also designed the advanced course, advanced ed science course that we teach in the ecosystem project. Dr. Timothy Glaude is in from the department is also from Xavier in the Department of Education and Counseling. And his responsibility is to, to communicate with the local schools. And he, he, he talks to the, the surrounding teachers and he, he organizes workshops with the teachers and talks to the school heads. And we also have the Louisiana Department of Environmental Quality. There are two officers from the, the Louisiana Department of Environmental Quality. These officers come to, to Xavier or either in person or through Zoom and talk to Xavier students about in, uh, environmental monitoring issues in the New, in the New Orleans area. And they also, the Louisiana Department of Environmental Quality also give us access to their monitoring sites so that we can go there and compare the sites with our sensors. 
and then we have the Institute of Earth Science Research and Education. This is a non-profit based in in Pennsylvania. The president of the Institute of Earth Science Research and Education, Dr. Brooks, is a serves as a consultant on this project. Dr. Brooks is the one who designed the prototype the PM sensor that we use. And he also is responsible for sourcing all the electronic components and equipment that we use for teaching and for building and maintaining these instruments. He, Dr. Brooks also acts as a resource person with the teachers that we work with and also with the students. He actually also participates in the teaching of the advanced earth science class, especially when it comes to, to do coding and he, he, he writing pro, Arduino programming. And then the other, com, the other partners are Morris Jeff teachers and students. So we started off with five teachers from Morris Jeff Community School in New Orleans. He, these teachers, each participating teacher has a PM sensor to use in their classroom and to deploy outside. The teachers have learned how to collect the data with the PM sensors, and they've also learned how to, 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 to access PM's data from the Louisiana Department of Environmental Quality and use that as, as part of their curriculum. So teachers, Teachers incorporate the, 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 the data they got from the sensors into their curriculum. And then we also have Xavier students. There are two types of Xavier students. We have got those students who are research students. And then we also have students who are part of the advanced ed science class. The research students are responsible for building the sensors and uh, deploying them around places in New Orleans. So far, they've deployed them at uh, three places around Xavier and one at a, a nearby school. And they collect data and they analyze the data from the PM sensors. The research students are also involved in various research projects. And then the other type of students are this, those students who actually who, who are enrolled in the advanced earth science course. E, these students mostly they we teach them we teach them how to analyze the data from the PM sensors, and we teach them to do a little bit of programming. They learn a lot of sketching e, and e, how to, to collect data from the sensors. Mm, yes. So, okay. So, so, so this, this, this is a summary. This, this, I got this from uh, uh, Dr. Brooks in one of the the, uh, the presentations. This kind of summarizes what the ecosystem uh, project is. The science focus is on particulate matter using Arduino's to collect environmental data and in particular we are focusing on pm 2.5 and pm 10 and with this science focus we are engaged with the community because we work with teachers teachers get professional development and they use the sensors with at their schools and besides the science the students in the advanced science class learn science they learn what is the AQI values, air quality index values? They learn about the effects of particulate matter on health. They learn about the variation of, of PM values with space and time. And they, they also do computational thinking. Students uh, learn how to do programming. They learn how to to solve problems uh, uh, using microcontrollers. And they do mathematics. 
like the advanced earth science class, they do data analysis, analyzing the data from the PM sensors, and they learn how to do the calibration. And they, we have engineering, integrating and monitor, integrating uh, the PM sensors into their class. So, 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 so this is a, a summary of what the ecosystem project is about. Now, a, a, let me see. So, so I, I want to talk a little bit about the actual sensor itself. The main component of the sensor is the, the Arduino microcontroller. And this Arduino microcontroller controls, there are basically three sensors. On this side here is the PM sensor, the one that measures particulate matter. And then on this other side here, we've got two other sensors, one that measures relative humidity and another that measures temperature. And these sensors are driven by, by a, the, the Arduino microcontroller, which is like a a simple computer. The Arduino microcontroller is an ideal instrument for environment, environmental monitoring by students because it is cheap. I think the, the first Arduinos that Dr. Brooks gave us were about this price here, about $20 each. But I'm sure now they've slightly gone up. But generally, they, they are low cost. And he, he, the Arduinos are compatible with many atmospheric sensors. So besides the PM sensor, we can put other sensors that monitor the environment. And on top of that, the software is free online. It's free for anybody can access it. And also there are tutorials that students can use. Most of the research students who learned how to use, how to do programming, did it by themselves by just going online and getting the sketches and learning and improving on their on their on their programming. So 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 now I, I just want to uh, to highlight some of the milestones of EcoSTEM uh, since we started in February. So uh, Dr. Brooks sent us the prototype in February. Uh, I understand at this point he had already thoroughly tested it but it was the first time that he sent the prototype to us and he, then in the summer two of our students actually built uh, these two sensors and he, they tested them inside and then they also tested them outside so that they were running well that was in the summer of 2021 and then again in the summer after after the students have tested the sensors we the next thing we wanted to do is to calibrate them to see how they compare with the, the ldq sensors the sensors from the louisiana department of environmental quality so we set them side by side this year this picture here shows the Louisiana Department of Environmental Quality monitoring site in City Park site in New Orleans. So we put our sensors side by side and the data we got was very encouraging. This data here shows that as far as the PM 2.5 is concerned, there is very close agreement both in trend and in values between our sensor, which is the blue one, in the LDQ sensor. And then as far as the uh, PM10 is concerned, we, we again notice that there's, the trend is the same, but the values from the LDQ were much higher than our values. And we are still trying to figure out why that is the case. Uh, and then uh, again, also last summer in July, we conducted our first a teacher training workshop. We have five teachers from Jeff Morris Community School. Three of them were from the middle school and the other two were from the high school. 
And the, 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 one of the important things about this workshop is that the main resource people for the workshop were these two students, these two Azavia students. They were the ones who were mainly training the students, mainly training the teachers on coding and uh, programming. And then uh, Dr. Glaude and Professor Dr. Brooks and me were just there to assist the students. And then again, in the summer of last year, we we wanted to put one of the PM sensors at a place close to 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 the industry, close to the road. So we have this this shelter here is very close. It's, it's a, it's, it is inside the Xavier campus, but it's close to the intersection of I-10 West and I-10 East. And since there was no power output, we installed a solar panel. So this is one of the two sensors that are run by a, a solar panel, which is at Xavier University. And, and then he, also one of our teachers, one of our participating teachers, Miss Sarah Lubo, made these screens for us. These are very good shelters for putting our sensor so that there is still good aeration, but there's protection from the rain. And Miss Lubo made about five of these, and we use them with wherever we put our sensors, we use these shelters. So again, this is another solar powered sensor. In this here, we have students, Xavier students, and the students from Jeff Morris School. They all came together to install another solar powered PM sensor at Jeff Morris High School. And their teacher, she's a physics teacher, so she uses this sensor to actually do physics projects for a class. And she also sends the data to us so that we put it in the main database and compare with other sensors that we have in the area in New at Xavier University. Uh, and also, also since, since, since last year, several of actually about three of our students made the presentations at the the AGU meeting two students made presentations at the AGU and recently this research student Niba made a presentation at the Xavier Festival of Scholars and she also recently made a presentation at the recently ended HBCU conference, climate conference, which was held here in New Orleans. Okay, so, 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 all these highlights that I've showed you, it, it, it seems to imply that it was all rosy with the project, but the truth is we have had a number of challenges and some of them we have overcome and some of them we are still working on. One of the constraints we have is like, ideally, I want to have more time with the advanced science class in doing microcontroller programming, but the time restrictions for just limit me to a few, a few weeks of doing in computer programming because we have to cover other, to cover other materials in the class. And also uh, another issue we have faced is that uh, some of the, the teachers that we started off with, they just moved off from the district and we no longer have access to them. And uh, 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 another issue uh, we have with uh, deploying sensors around the New Orleans area is that there are issues with the students moving, going to these sensors to either maintain them or collect the data. And so far we are figuring out what is the best way of, of going about this. Most of the time I go with the students, but I would want a situation 
where students can go by themselves and maintain these sites. And uh, so one of the aspirations that we have is we want, so far we are focused on only particulate meter 2.5 and particulate meter 10, but we want to expand our air quality monitoring to, to include gaseous pollutants like ozone. And uh, we also want to develop means of accessing the PM data remotely. Because right now we have to actually drive to the site to collect the data from a, from an SD card and download it to a computer. So one of the projects that our our students are working on is to to see if we can access the data remotely. And then also a, a, another issue we are aspiring to do and we are working on is to include uh, community organizations, not necessarily schools but other community organizations who are interested in air quality monitoring. We want to include them into the ecosystem system. And finally, so I just want to, this is the, the ecosystem website. It is attached to the Institute of Earth Science and Research Education website. And on this website, that's where we have all our, our news items and also all the data that we collect is also you can also access the data here on this website and uh, i think that's finally i uh, just want to acknowledge these people who are helping us with the project i think that's about it great thank you so much more um we really enjoyed learning more about your ecostem project and we're looking forward to connecting in breakout rooms um, as well um, so now i want to turn it over to our final presenter um dr sonia remington you who is a senior associate professor at bellevue college um, sonia over to you thank you lauren so welcome for everyone here, who here, who's here today, and thank you for being here and allowing me to present. So I'm attending this meeting from the traditional and occupied lands of the coastal Salish peoples, and I just want to acknowledge first, as we start here, that I'm grateful to live and work on these lands. Today, I'd like to provide an overview of a climate justice faculty professional development curriculum that supports community college faculty as they work to incorporate civic engagement for climate justice into their 100 and 200 level courses. And this is across the STEM curriculum. And I'll also provide very preliminary results on how this project affects student learning in STEM. So Sea Justice is the name of the IU's project that is funding these efforts, as well as some internal funding from our institutions. And notice that we call community engagement, civic engagement instead. And I'll explain a little bit more about why that is in a bit. Before I start, I want to acknowledge that the faculty PD curriculum we're developing grew out of a method for integrating sustainability into college courses that was created by the curriculum for the bioregion project. And I adapted this method to make it specific to climate justice and civic engagement and used it for the first time with faculty at Bellevue College in 2018. So this is a picture of me on the left holding a sign at a chemistry educators conference a few years ago. And then I began collaborating with Heather Price, who's pictured here on the right, holding a similar sign at the same conference. So this was our form of civic engagement at this conference. Heather and I both teach at community colleges, and we've been co-developing the faculty PD curriculum together for the past two years. And about a year ago, we were awarded our NSF IUS grant. Heather's here today too, and she'll be facilitating one of the breakout rooms later. So as part of the grant, we also started collaborating with Sensor, which is about science education for new civic engagement and responsibilities, and it's a national initiative. So there's a long history of collaboration here and adapting what others have done, so I wanted to acknowledge that first. As we're getting started here, I'd like to offer an opportunity 
for everyone to see where everyone else who is here today is at when it comes to climate. So first, I'd like to ask you to take the SASE survey. So I'm putting a link to that survey in the chat. If you'd all click on that link, what you'll see is a very quick four question multiple choice survey. And SASE stands for Six Americas Super, Super Short Survey, a tongue twister. Um, and what this survey does is it gauges how you feel about climate change. Are you alarmed, concerned, cautious, disengaged, doubtful, or dismissive? So when you see your result, remember what it is and then enter it into the chat. And then the second thing I'd like you to enter into the chat along with that is to share if you have ever taught about climate or climate justice specifically in a STEM course. If you have, what was the course? And if you have not, have you ever thought about incorporating climate justice into a STEM course? While you're doing that, I want to mention what the striped pattern on my slides is all about. So these are called warming stripes. And from left to right, they go from blue, which would be the cooler temperatures, to red, the warmer temperatures. And these stripes show the long-term increase of the average global temperature from 1850 on the left to 2020 on the right. My collaborator, Heather, had a dress made with these stripes. I don't have a dress, but I do wear a warming stripes mask. And both of these are forms of civic engagement as well focused on climate. What I'm hoping to do today is give you a brief definition of climate justice and some reasons for integrating this issue into our STEM teaching. Then I'll give some background and an overview of our faculty PD curriculum and our Sea Justice project. And then I'll follow that with some examples of how Heather and I integrate climate justice and civic engagement into our chemistry courses. And then I'll br very briefly, right at the end, share some preliminary findings from pre-post student surveys that are part of our IUS work and specifically related to the civic engagement aspects of that work. So first, a working definition of climate justice. It's about taking action for a just transition by recognizing the disproportionate effects of climate change on marginalized groups and future generations. So the civic engagement piece comes in with the action part of this definition, the word highlighted in blue on this slide. So climate justice is inherently about taking action through civic engagement, particularly by those who are privileged enough to be able to safely and effectively do so. So why integrate climate justice into STEM courses? Well, one reason shown on this slide is that it can improve student learning and broaden participation of women and racial and ethnic groups that are underrepresented in STEM fields. So this quote on the right is from the well-known 1997 publication talking about leaving, which is about why students leave STEM fields. And it illustrates why including climate justice in our STEM courses could broaden participation of underrepresented groups. So the student quoted here expressed a concern that his STEM education is not preparing him for a career that will allow him to give back to his community. And there's research emerging recently in the literature to support this as well. So the equity ethic, which is the paper shown on the upper left was published in 2017. And the phrase equity ethic refers to students principled concern for social justice. And it explains why a social justice centered approach to STEM teaching can be more appealing to groups typically underrepresented in STEM fields, particularly students um, of color and women. Because when these students can see that STEM can be used to help their communities, then they're more likely to pursue a STEM major, stay in a STEM major, or end up in a STEM career. So many of you have shared or are sharing your SASE score in the chat. So here are the data from that survey that has been collected by the Yale Program on Climate Change Communication since 2010. And you can see that the number of people concerned and alarmed about climate change has greatly increased over the last decade. 
So concerned is the green ball and alarmed is the blue ball. And you can see the blue alarmed ball starts at the bottom group, but then it shoots up beginning in about 2015 and then almost doubles by 2020. So everyone is becoming more worried about climate and even more worried than average are our BIPOC students. This slide shows the results of the most recent polls conducted by Yale. And they show that both Black and Hispanic Americans are much more concerned and alarmed about climate change than white Americans. And it's also interesting to note the sex-based the sex differences as well. So this information tells a story that BIPOC communities are more concerned because of the disproportionate impact that climate change will have on these communities. Next, I wanna move through a series of quotes to illustrate a few points. First, students are demanding a climate education that goes beyond the science, and that is non-Eurocentric and intersectional, and includes literacy on issues like climate justice and environmental racism and ancestral and indigenous wisdom. Students wanna be taught about the future risks and vulnerabilities they face and they want us grown-ups to improve school curricula so that they can learn how to mitigate the climate crisis. In thinking about our students as future scientists, engineers, and other STEM professionals, here's a quote that gets into the civic engagement aspects, and it's by Sarah Meyer, a climate scientist. So she talks about how scientists are doing a bad job if they're just sitting on the sidelines and documenting the world burning around them. And more and more scientists are engaging civically. You may have heard last week about the protests by climate scientists taking place around the world. And our young students, ages about 30 and younger, whether they're going into STEM fields or not, they are the climate generation. And they've known climate change their entire lives. And they recognize the need to take action and push for systemic change through civic engagement due to government inaction. So young students like Aji Piper on this slide, a 20 year old Seattle climate activist recognizes that our governments have failed to act. And as a result, he has taken action and engaged civically. So hopefully that gave you a decent introduction to climate justice. Next, I want to provide some background on our faculty PD curriculum, which is part of our Sea Justice project. This slide shows an overview of the faculty PD curriculum that we offer each year at Bellevue College. So the overall goal of this project has been to integrate civic engagement for climate justice across the curriculum so that students learn about these things in every class that they take at our colleges. This year at Bellevue College, we offered a summer institute, learning communities throughout the year and workshops. And for all of these, we use our faculty PD curriculum to support faculty as they work to integrate civic engagement for climate justice into their courses. And faculty earn stipends for this work and we've built a curriculum repository that contains faculty lessons. So here's a list of examples of lessons and campus activities created by faculty from Heather's College, North Seattle College, that have completed the faculty PD curriculum. They created these lessons as part of that curriculum. You can see some of the STEM disciplines involved here. We've got stats, physics, and a few chemistry courses. For the faculty PD curriculum, we have two outcomes that we use to focus the climate justice lessons created and taught by faculty. So the first is that the lesson should make clear to students the connections between climate change and racial, economic, gender, intergenerational, and other forms of injustice. And we use the two dimensions of climate justice shown here. We've got intergenerational justice on the left and intragenerational justice on the right. And the second piece that each lesson should have is to teach students how to engage civically with a community beyond the classroom on the topic of climate justice. So this is not service learning. And we emphasize this with faculty. There are many possible ways to engage with a community outside of the classroom. So you can have students do something small like wear a button or 
talk with family and friends about climate justice or post to social media. And it can get bigger too, such as calling a legislator or attending a protest or volunteering. Civic engagement doesn't even have to involve students taking action. So on the right here, you can see that there are many dimensions of civic engagement. We do strongly encourage faculty to have their students take action because action fosters hope. And students need that when they're learning about overwhelming social issues like climate injustice. But there are other things faculty can do with their students. They can teach them the skills or offer the knowledge students need to be an engaged citizen. Or maybe students feel a greater responsibility or a commitment toward being an engaged citizen as a result of a climate justice lesson. So teaching STEM in the context of climate justice is more than teaching the facts or the science. It means teaching using a systems thinking approach that connects STEM to the social issues that our students care about in the real world. And it gives students the tools and the skills for civic engagement that will help them repair the problems that they're learning about by working toward systemic change, not just individual, small scale, personal, personal action. This is an example of one of the first templates that faculty fill out when they join a workshop where they are working to integrate civic engagement for climate justice into their course. The example here is from Heather's chemistry course. This template has faculty think through the concepts and skills they need to teach in their courses, regardless of whether they include civic engagement for climate justice in their teaching. These are climate justice big ideas that we provide for faculty and they choose at least one and work to integrate it into their course alongside the STEM concepts and skills that they're teaching. These are ideas for civic engagement we offer faculty and we emphasize that it's not enough to just teach students about a problem. We also need to empower them with the skills and tools to address the problems. And also that having them take action through civic engagement will likely leave students feeling more hopeful. There's this concept called active hope, the book shown here on the right of this slide. And it's about how taking action leads to feelings of hope. It's not the other way around as many people may think. And finally, along the same lines, we ask faculty to bring positive solutions focused stories into their climate justice lesson. So the examples on this slide are from my chemistry course. And doing this is important because educators teaching about big problems, um, if they don't do this, it can foster apathy and hopelessness in our students. So we as educators have to move away from our typical doom and gloom style of bringing this information to our classrooms toward actively fostering hope by seeking out positive stories about solutions to climate change that are working. Because the media you now focuses on disaster. So these positive stories largely go unheard unless we bring them into our classrooms. And Ellen Kelsey talks about this in her book, Hope Matters, which is in the center of the slide here. Then we bring all of this together into this template. During our faculty workshops, most of the time is spent brainstorming in collaboration with faculty from other disciplines to fill in all of these boxes and especially the big white box in the middle, which is the details of the implementation. Here's an example of what this looks like when it's complete and like Morwell, the second panelist who just presented, Heather and I focus a lot on air pollution in our courses. This is a lesson from one of Heather's chemistry courses and it's focused on summertime wildfire smoke and impacts on human health. You can see on the upper left, the yellow box. Um, this box includes the chemistry concepts and skills, which would be significant figures and units. On the upper right in the pink box is the climate justice big idea. Then for civic engagement, the blue box on the lower left, her students make and test a box filter fan, which cleans air in a home of particulate matter. And they also have conversations with family and friends. And then finally, the solutions focused story that she shares in the gray box on the lower right 
is about a local Seattle organization called Got Green that distributes air filters to communities during wildfire smoke season. And then in the middle are the details of how she implements the lesson in her course. Now we wanna give some more examples of integrating civic engagement for climate justice into chemistry. Heather and I both teach chemistry, so these are the examples we have, but we have many other STEM faculty working on this in a wide variety of STEM disciplines at our colleges. A quick overview of the flow of my course. So I thread climate justice and civic engagement throughout, and I bring it in whenever it's relevant to the chemistry content and skills I'm teaching. I do this in the first quarter of general chemistry with a few course components. So one is a research project focused on fossil fuel derived air pollution. I also introduced some climate justice case studies along the way and solutions focused current events. And I have two civic engagement pieces, one in the middle of the quarter and one at the very end. So I'd like to spend a few minutes expanding on the civic engagement pieces so that you get a feel for what this looks like in a general chemistry course. The first piece is an introductory activity that I do midway through the quarter that I'd like to quickly walk you through. I just published it on Carleton College's Science Education Resource Center curriculum repository site. And the direct link to this activity is at the bottom of the slide if you're interested in checking it out. So the overarching climate justice issue that I focus on for this activity um, are two of them, disproportionate impacts of PM 2.5 pollution and also global climate change. I use a documentary about air pollution and climate change in Mongolia to catch student attention and interest and engage their emotions before we even go into any of the chemistry. So in the documentary, there's a baby boy who's having difficulty breathing because the air in the city is so polluted. And his parents are advised by their doctor to temporarily move to the countryside to find clean air. And the sad irony here is that many families like his who are living in the city have moved there from the countryside to seek employment because in the countryside, climate change is making deep freezes in winter and also drought in summer more and more common. And this degrades the pastures where their livestock graze. So they depend on their livestock for their livelihood. And because of climate change, they've become climate refugees, forced to move to these polluted cities with unbreathable air. And then they return to the countryside as pollution refugees, as one of my students called them, to find clean air to breathe. So after this documentary, students are very engaged and they wanna know more about the chemistry and I help them connect the climate justice issues to the chemistry that they're learning. And I also do some work with them on systems thinking in chemistry too, but I wanna focus on the part of this activity relevant to today, which is the assignment um, on civic engagement. And I adapted this from an assignment Heather created for her chemistry course. So for this activity, I frame civic engagement for students around building their science communication skills. And I have students talk to a friend or family member about the climate justice issues in the Mongolia documentary, and also talk about how it's connected to the chemistry that they're learning in the course. And then they post to a discussion board about the conversation. Bringing in current events is a great and simple way to bring civic engagement into a course because it helps students gain the skills and knowledge needed to be engaged citizens. And it fosters those other dimensions of civic engagement I mentioned earlier as well. So an example in fall 2020, I mentioned the wildfire smoke in the Western US that was drifting into the Puget Sound where Bellevue College is located and how these summertime fires are caused in large part by the hot and dry conditions created by climate change and also how the smoke from the fires contains PM 2.5 pollution, which the students are breathing. I also integrate climate into a quarter long research project. So Purple Air is a company that provides online downloadable PM 2.5 data from sensors that are installed all over the world. So one of the students options for a research project is to use the PM 2.5 data from Purple Air time series and also to measure it themselves 
um, collect spatial data using these DILOS PM monitors. Then I raised the issue of indoor air quality during wildfire season when we're all sealed in our homes and how under these conditions, indoor CO2 can rise to unhealthy levels. So another research project option for students is for them to study indoor or outdoor CO2 levels using these very simple household monitors. And then students take the results of their research projects and at the very end of the quarter and use them in some sort of civic engagement activity. So this slide shows different ideas for civic engagement. I showed this slide earlier. It's the same one we show to our faculty. And for my students, it's sort of a choose your own adventure. And there's a wide range of things that they do. So some students have emailed the Bellevue College Board of Trustees about high pollution levels on the south side of our campus, which is located near a freeway. Another student presented to the Bellevue Parks Department about the effect of trees on outdoor CO2 levels. And that student actually ended up presenting her research at Posters on the Hill last year in Washington, DC. That's a, a council and undergraduate research event. One student you know, published a blog post about unhealthy indoor CO2 levels in local Seattle coffee shops. And many just present to their family and friends when they make measurements in their homes. So students come up with all sorts of creative ideas. And finally, very, very quickly, just two more slides. I want to just give you a broad overview of some preliminary results from C Justice that are relevant to this session today. So in fall 2021, six faculty that are part of our C Justice project um, and who were teaching courses in the disciplines listed on this slide administered pre post surveys to students in their classes where they were teaching these climate justice and civic engagement lessons. And here are the two main preliminary findings. And I don't have time to show you the actual data. The first is that climate change and racial inequality are top issues for students. Students want these issues taught in their STEM courses. And the second is that students have a desire to be more engaged in their communities civically. And by the end of a course into which you know, civic engagement for climate justice has been integrated, they now view STEM as a tool for civic engagement. So thanks for listening. And if you have any questions, please feel free to contact me or Heather. And we really both look forward to talking with you more about all of this in the breakout sessions that are coming up next. Great, thank you so much, Sonia. We look forward to the breakout discussions. Um, and speaking of, we are going to transition to breakout rooms. Okay, welcome back to the main session, everybody. Um, I'm wondering if we can get our speakers and facilitators to share a quick um, one minute recap of what their group discussed um, and some of the discussion points from your group. Okay, so we had a great conversation in our group. Uh, and um, a couple of questions that made me think like I, maybe I missed a, or not I, I didn't emphasize some things like um, a, a colleague asked you know like what was STEM about this idea because uh, it's like it's a social science thing uh, you know um, and um, so our research groups are you know because of sort of findings um, uh, uh, in the research about you know struggles that students of color have with STEM advising and STEM courses and the climate in STEM units on campus, uh, we are taking our evidence and oriented towards you know, interventions to support students of color. Uh, we've done a workshop, for example, devised a workshop uh, for STEM advisors, uh, and we are addressing, we're writing reports for leadership about policy changes that we think can help. Um, so it's a kind of like STEM, how it has connected to STEM is it's a form of social science, uh, and it's it's a model that we think can be applied into other STEM contexts. Um, and then, you know, it's a kind of STEM education and STEM policy research and advocacy. Uh, so that was a great question. And then there were a lot of questions about the kind of mechanics, you know, like how do you keep a, a group like, you, maybe you can get a group like this started, how do you keep it funded? You know, what do you do with, you know, lab equipment and like, you know, expensive, you know, tools and, uh, um, and uh, so we we discussed some of the you know and like how do you incorporate this into a course? I think that's a really interesting um, discussion. And so we 
Um, I mean, we didn't come up with like, you know, all the answers. I, I, I shared some of my insights from my own experience. And also, I think we all agreed that um, whatever the, the model that I communicated, like the specifics of it, I think like that there's things that can be taken and incorporated into your own programs. It doesn't have to be like the whole exact model of action research or PAR action research. Uh, um, we also noted some connection of this to like sort of the people science movements and the public science movements, uh, um, you know, as a kind of inspiration. Um, so I think, you know, that's, you know, a couple of the things, but I think, you know, we were interested in the, um, some of the practicalities. Um, so uh, I can turn off now. Thank you. Great, thank you. Sounds like a great discussion. Um, I'll turn it over to Morwell. Hey, okay, so so he, uh, I tried to move from one breakout room to the other because I also wanted to listen to what other uh, discussions were going on. But from our group, we one thing we we talked about was that a lot of uh, people are also using uh, trying to incorporate the PM uh, monitoring into their STEM courses. For example, there's a school in New York where they are using people air sensors. These people air sensors are, there are so many all over the country and they can access the data and use the data as part of their STEM, STEM course or for students to do some data analysis. We also talked about the challenges that are involved when you are working with 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 teachers teachers are generally very busy and sometimes it's difficult for them to be committed for a long time on a project so 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 people came up with some various ideas on how you can actually instead of having the teachers being responsible for 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 the activities that you are doing we have our own students do the work but into the schools that that the sensors are so i thought that was a good a, a good idea and uh, yeah i think generally the other thing that came up is a lot of people are involved like trying to make stem education more interesting by incorporating hands-on activities like we do with the with the Arduinos in our course, in our ecosystem course. Yeah, I think that's about it. Great, thanks. Um, and it sounds great that you hit on kind of some of those challenges with um, faculty being busy and kind of brainstorming some ideas. So sounds like a great discussion. Um, I'll turn it over to Sonia. Yeah, hi. So we talked a lot about strategies for getting faculty to integrate issues like climate justice, you know, social justice issues into their STEM courses, as well as a civic engagement into STEM. And collaboration with the Sensor Project came up, um, that national initiative. They're, they're really great to work with. So um, we kind of concluded that if you're interested in you know, doing more civic engagement around any issue, that they're a great resource. Um, we talked a little bit about student pushback around hearing about social issues in a science course. And in that we didn't really, I mean, at least I shared that in my experience, I haven't gotten a ton of pushback from from science students about issues like climate justice. Um, there's just a lot of sharing of resources around those two things, um, getting faculty to do this and getting students to accept this. And um, students are just usually excited about it. So they don't tend to, to have a lot of pushback once they get engaged. Um, and then finally, right at the end, we were talking about the importance of a solutions focus when teaching about big social problems. You know, what are people doing about these problems in the world? What are things that are working and things that we're making progress on? So I think that was about it. 
that was m much of the conversation. Awesome, sounds like a very interesting discussion. Um, and then I'll turn it over to your colleague, Heather. Hi, thank you. Uh, in our breakout room, there was a lot of discussion about how to bring in these climate justice issues into our courses and how to make it connect locally. Um, some of the folks were from New Jersey, um, from the East Coast and talking and also Houston and talking about kind of those sacrifice zones, um, the how uh, the pollution centers and uh, Houston area tend to be in black, brown uh, neighborhoods, communities, um, the flooding that's occurring and who's being harmed in Jersey, you know, um, and uh, things like that. And even um, so there was that question of what to bring in, but then also not just leaving our students with the problem, like a doctor's not just gonna give us the test results and walk away, but also how then to connect that with the civic or community engagement and what that looks like um, and kind of discuss some ideas around how to do that um, either as a discussion post or um, uh, in an assignment or you know where do we fit that into our classes, especially today with so many of our classes being partially online and hybrid. So it was a really rich discussion about the kind of nuts and bolts of how to bring in the climate justice issue and then also that civic engagement piece. Um, and then uh, just like Sonia's group, a little bit on um, what do we do if there's pushback from our students and like Sonia, I haven't seen that in my classes, um, but that is something to think about. Uh, and then also how to fit in these ideas, these topics into courses like I teach general chemistry, some of the faculty that um, were in the breakout room teach the general biology courses, and does something then need to get moved out versus something. Um, and so just an, a way of thinking about ways of or discussing ways of um, shifting the examples, right? Instead of an example using a fishbowl, using examples with rivers, so real world and making it local. So those were just really nice, rich conversations I think we had. And thank you. Great, thank you. Um, so before we go, I would just like to thank all of our speakers and facilitators, um, the rest of the AAAS IUS team, and to all of you who are able to join and participate in the workshop today. We do have a post-event survey link, which we are posting in the chat and sending over email. Um, and we really value your feedback and hope to continue to improve these workshops throughout the year. Um, we do have five more workshops this year, so we look forward to hopefully seeing you at more of those. Um, and additionally, the recording and presentation will be made available on our website in the coming days. You should receive an email when those are posted. Um, and once again, thank you for joining us. And as always, we look forward to continue our continued engagement with you um, and continued learning from you. So um, thanks everyone. Have a great rest of your day.